anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Jessica Ransom. I'm the director of artist services here. And so I run all the galleries and um, work with our education director on art talks such as this and a bunch of other stuff, um, sort of jack of all trades. <laughs> um, I put together this panel of really wonderful people that I've known throughout my art career, um, met them in different um, aspects of my art career. And uh, I'll start with Sebastian Clark who I met um, when I first was working um, in the art market as an art advisor. I was working for Winston Art Group, so I was an art appraiser at that time, and start, was working with um, Sebastian with collectors who were buying and selling art, auctioning art, and so he worked for Doyle Auction House. He's also, um, I remember the first time I turned on the Antiques Roadshow, I saw Sebastian, I was like, oh look, there's Sebastian. <laughs> um, so I'll note though, that because I make that point, just because you have an object that <laughs> needs to be questioned, you know, you need some questions about that, hold those questions till the end, talk to Sebastian, get his card afterwards. We're not gonna be talking about that today, okay? <laughs> um, Cheryl Wood is our art lawyer. I met Cheryl when I moved here to Palm Beach. I was working as an art appraiser at that time, but Cheryl's also very, very active in the community, and I think we actually met through Impact of Palm Beaches, maybe, where I was um, a, a, for a while president of that philanthropic organization, and she's super, super involved in the community. So um, Cheryl's got a very long career in the art world, not only as an art lawyer, she um, was general counsel in several different um, law firms, mm -hmm. correct? Government entities. Government entities. Florida Waterman, Kansas okay. City, and okay. Palm Beach County School District, I was their general counsel, and then I'm in private practice now. Um, and then Catherine McCullough was my partner in crime when mm -hmm. I was managing um, the culture lab at City Place, when City Place was City Place, mm -hmm. was a contemporary art installation, and Catherine and I worked together on that. Um, it was a one year project that um, Related Company did at City Place in the old Macy's building. I don't know if anybody had the opportunity mm -hmm. to see that. And Catherine um, runs her own art advisory here in Palm Beach and sells worldwide to, to private collectors, but also um, commercial or ordering private, commercial corporate. Okay. And then Melissa Del Preti owns and runs the Mountain Space Gallery, which if you cross the street and go down about a block, you're going to find her gallery, along with Kenny Schofield, who's here today, um, her gallery director. We're really, really lucky to have a local art gallery that supports both local and national and internationally known artists, emerging and established artists. And they work super closely with us, um, helping artists in the community, and they've been just a real joy to have around as fellow art geeks. So <laughs> welcome to the whole panel. Um, that's my brief introduction. I'm going to let them um, go. We'll start with Melissa. Tell us one thing and then go down the line about you, why you love art, why you've chosen to work in the field, or what you find exciting about the art market. Um, it's just one. <laughs> <laughs> you got one. Okay. Yeah, just one. All right. Um, well, I guess I'll start with why I love art. Um, when I was when I was a kid, the art room was my sacred space, and it became my my practice. So that's how I got into art was through my own art making practice, and it's just been o an avenue for me to see myself and to grow and to connect with people in the community. Um, I'm not the most communicative person. I think I speak with my art, so being able to have art to connect to other people is it's amazing for me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, why I work in this field, um, I can I think it's best to describe how I got started. Mm -hmm. So I studied art history when I was at university, and then I worked at um, various art institutions in New York uh, for a few years before I had the opportunity to move to Paris and to study studio painting. Mm -hmm. Whilst there, I met an artist, a photographer called Jesse Blondis, and he actually showed me a painting he had done, a beautiful landscape painting, oil on wood, and it was a cow in a field. And I thought, wow, this is really stunning. And I said, you know, paint about you know a handful more of those for me, and I think I can sell those for you. And he agreed, and he did, and I did, and we sold out the show. And subsequently, I organized uh, further shows for emerging artists. And so what started in this um, tiny apartment in a six-floor walk-up in Paris 
and this one show turned into a 30 year plus career mm -hmm. in uh, art curating and consulting. I worked with private clients, corporate clients, primary market, secondary market. I love I love the creative process. I love working with artists and learn, learning why they do what they do. I love being around collectors and art enthusiasts. And I can uh, safely say that I am as excited today uh, when I find a great piece of art or meet a promising artist as I was all those years ago when I first saw that painting of the cow in the field. Mm -hmm. And that is why I continue to do what I do. Wow. Um, I think for me, it, it, art, and I'm not the talented one, I'm just the one, I mean, I do art for therapeutic reasons, but no one would want it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think from growing up as a kid, it evokes feelings. You know, when you're in your art classes, and thank goodness for the school system, um, they, you know, have art teachers, and let's hope we keep that and, and increase it because it's certainly diminished. Um, but you, you learn about things, and you feel things, and you see how history was before they had cameras. Um, people would paint things, and you'd go, oh, that's the way they did things in the olden days. And, you know, and it was just very interesting to me. And then as you grow up, and the schools, again, continue to bring you to performing arts. And, and while I was in New York for a while as a kid, you know, the nuns would bring us into Radio City, and you know, we'd see you know, that glory of all that. And when I was in junior college here, they brought me to the Flagler Museum. And thank goodness for all those things, because then you feel it. And I got into um, the, the legal field, and I, I was practicing, you know, I've been practicing over 30 years, and for most of my practice, while I was in government practice, didn't conflict with what I did, so I represented art organizations pro bono, and I, I've done a lot of them around here. Um, in this one I started with, I think Will Ray, Ray was the director at the time, that was a long time ago. <laughs> so that's that's why I like art, and I continue to do it. Um, I decided I would uh, do full-time art law when I retired from the uh, government practice. Um, there wasn't enough of it, because my husband just like, I need to do other stuff, so I'm doing water law too, but my specialty is contracts and intellectual property, and so. Um, what I love about the art market, my job, no two days in the auction business are the same. Um, you, you can have the highest expectations and walk into the finest home and it is the most miserable group of property you've ever experienced, <laughs> or you can seriously consider not getting out of the car because terrified might what, what might happen and make the greatest discovery of your career. <laughs> One of the other things I really love about the art market, it's really confusing to everybody. It's a huge mystery. And I really enjoy helping people figure it out and navigate their way through. It is offering guidance and so much of what we do, um, whether it's the, the pleasure I have working on Antiques Roadshow where we're volunteers, we don't get paid to do that, or just the number of emails or inquiries or questions I get about the art market, it's just helping people understand something, which to me, I know like the back of my hand, just the auction portion, but to other people, it's a huge mystery. So I really love mm -hmm. that and every day being completely different. So um, Catherine mentioned the primary and secondary market. So um, I think it, we really need to explain that. And Sebastian, you wanna give us a- Sure, so I, I wrote this, so if it's wrong, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so there's a real difference between the primary and the secondary market. And firstly, one thing I didn't put in there. So the art market is the largest unregulated market in the world. And it's approximately $64 billion in registered sales globally. And there's no uh, restrictions, there's no uh, requirements. So it can be very, very difficult and challenging to, to navigate. So the primary market, which also we like to say is retail, is for living artists, which one term for term is often used for the first sale of an artist's work. So let's say hung on a wall, painted, sold out in a gallery, either through a gallery or an artist's studio. In the broader art market, the phrase is commonly used to define a retail buying experience, such as a gallery, show, art fair, or a transaction with a dealer. Prices in the primary market closely mirror insurance values, also known as retail replacement. So that's a high value. And I like to, the easiest way for me to explain it is, so my wife is a jewelry specialist, is a Rolex. 
if you lose your Rolex and it is insured, and that you have insurance and Chubb Insurance says, okay, go ahead and just go, go buy a new one. You walk into your local Rolex dealer, you find that model, you don't negotiate, you pay their asking price, which is a very, very high price. So that's primary market value. Secondary market um, is um, resale, which is uh, auction houses represent buyers and sellers and charge a commission to each party. These sales are transparent for the most part because they're online and in the public domain. And the definition of secondary market is between a willing and unpressured buyer and a willing and unpressured seller. So that very same Rolex that's worth $15,000 retail on the secondary market may only be worth three or $4,000 because they're two different arenas and price points. So it's really important to understand that when you're considering acquiring and selling your collections, where you're going to sell them and what is the price point and market that you're working in. So does anyone have any questions around that before we move on or is that? Yes. So when, how do you qualify private sales by auction houses? So these private not, sales. I'm sorry, these are not transparent. They're, you're correct, they're not transparent, frustratingly so because in theory the, the definition of the private sale being private you're going to be pushing towards the higher end of the market <coughs> value. You're going to be closer to primary market value because the idea of a private sale is it's exclusive and it's before something comes up for sale. Um, for instance, we recently sold a painting. The auction estimate was fifty to $70,000 and a buyer said, I have to have that. And the transaction was above the high estimate because that was the motivation for the seller was I'm going to do better than I might do at auction and sell it. Um, and then the buyer is stopping it from coming to public auction. So it's a, it's a private sale which floats towards the primary market price, and that's a great question. Yes? So you said that the primary price would be higher yeah. than the expected secondary, mm -hmm. and I think of it as the other way around. Well, no, because primary is let's say you let's say you're a, let's say you're a dealer and you buy a painting at auction for ten thousand dollars and you have a gallery space and you have staff and you have insurance and you've got overheads. You buy that painting for ten thousand dollars on the secondary market. You're going to price it in your staff store from probably closer to thirty thousand to make your profit and cover your expenses. So that's sort of a good way to look at it. Okay, I misunderstood the way you were presenting. Okay, mm -hmm. so that good. Yes. Um, you might also want to mention that if there is private sales at an auction house, the buyer does not have to pay a buyer's premium, which they normally would do at auction. That is, co that is correct. That's traditionally baked into the price. So it's while it's, can candidly, as I once heard a colleague say to a client on the telephone, we are a for-profit business. <laughs> and so we have to, an auction house or a dealer or anybody selling has to factor in what they make, and for an auction house, it's a commission, and we'll bake it into a private sale. But private sales, while they occupy a huge portion numerically of the art market, they actually occupy the smallest portion of actual transactions. So some of these may say, we did $7 billion last year in sales, and um, of that, $1 billion was in private sales. So it, it's only one-seventh of their, their, their business because it's, a lot of it is auction. Okay, so moving on with the secondary market. If we're dealing with the secondary mar market, we want to talk about buying and selling strategies yes. as you're preparing to sell on the secondary market. Sure, again, market. I wrote this, so I'm sure there's bits I missed. Um, it, but it's all about questions. When you're buying, ask questions. Condition, provenance, size. I know that's a silly thing, but the, the number of clients we had purchase things and then they don't, they don't fit in the building. Um, but doing your homework, um, make sure the source you're buying from is reputable. Now with the internet, I mean, start, it sounds so silly, just start with Google. You'll get so much information. Research comparable prices, uh, consider what your additional expenses might be, and understand if you're buying from a platform such as First Dibs, it's highly curated and you pay a huge premium for that. Whereas buying at auction, there are some inherent risks with that but there's the opportunity to buy something at a lesser price. But then you'd have to consider buyer's premium, <coughs> transportation, all those <coughs> things. And the same thing is with selling as well, is asking questions, target your potential seller or auction house, understand what fees you will be paying, um, 
and don't be afraid to negotiate and make sure you review the consignment agreement. Um, and also just doing your homework, it's almost the same thing. Source, are they reputable? Comparable results, what other expenses? I mean, this is where an art advisor comes in and their job is to help you navigate this. And while there may be a fee involved working for them, in theory, it is going to achieve a much higher result for that piece or that collection. Mm -hmm. So, speaking of art advisors, what do you consider when defining a collection? Okay, so I'll speak to you about defining a collection and also why you use an art uh, advisor. So um, the images you're gonna be seeing are all um, images from projects that we've worked on in the past uh, year, year and a half uh, here locally. I work with my colleague, Joe Met, who's in the audience today, and we sourced locally. So we used local artists and we sourced from, sourced from local galleries. Uh, all right, defining a collection. Trust your instinct, have goals, focus, and do your research. First, you have to think about a medium. Are you collecting paintings, sculpture, photography, prints, ceramics, textiles? There's, there's a world of art out there, so maybe narrow in on what you'd like to uh, concentrate on. Is there a theme? Could be region, style, artist, movement, period, concepts, philosophies, or characteristics? Is your collection gonna have a specific focus or is it gonna be a more general, comprehensive collection? You can concentrate on iconic works from one artist or iconic works, works from a period. Size, yes, size is important. <laughs> um, are you going to be concentrating on smaller works, larger works, orientation of the work, the number or the number of pieces in your overall collection? So size of the work or size of the and again, yes, you've got to make sure the size fits the space where you want the work to go. Budget, uh, try to stick to a budget if you can. Um, you can decide that maybe each artwork will cost a certain amount, or you decide on a certain amount that you want to spend on the entire collection. Investment value, now this is hard to determine because no one can predict what the market is going to do. We always advise our clients, buy what you like, buy what you love and you want to live with. However, of course, there are people out there who are buying exclusively for investment. There are art funds and collectors who mean to you know, flip the work in a, in a matter of years. So decide how important this is to you and uh, how long you're holding on to this piece and um, are you uh, buying it to allow for appreciation. So understand uh, investment value. Provenance, very important. Provenance is the history of the piece. So if you're buying primary market, we are buying directly from the artist or from a gallery who in theory is buying it directly from that artist. So as a client, perhaps you've seen this work on the walls of the studio. Uh, you discuss the work with the artist. You know where this work is coming from. Um, in the secondary market, it's a little trickier because that's, that's harder to figure out. So do your research, uh, find out what other collections it's been in, has it been in other you know, exhibits, other auctions, how much exposure has it had, is it an important piece, is there a catalog resume on this work, what page is it on? This all uh, goes to prove, uh, helps to speak to authenticity, and that is very important because you have to know that you are getting the real deal. And again, if you, if you sell it, it's very important proving authenticity and provenance. Uh, aesthetic important because uh, you've got to collect something that resonates with you uh, personally. Uh, you have your own personal aesthetic or set of aesthetics. You buy it again because you love it and you want to uh, live with it. And I also wrote down there collecting, you know, is for everyone. You're, you know, collecting one piece for many pieces. So you ready to move on? Yeah. Okay. So, so, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on problems, the more we read about that, we see that collectors have, um, have found that they have works that they paid X amount for, believing it had a certain provenance, and then finding that it was a fake. Is there any way of including in your contract of sale um, a guarantee of provenance as provided by the seller or the auction house? Well, Sebastian probably can speak to secondary market. I know that you know in, in, in primary market, again, you know where it's coming from. And in secondary market, when I buy for clients and I'm buying at auction, 
in theory, the auction house is doing that work because they would not be liable, they would not be showing you know, such a piece unless they had done their due diligence. Um, maybe some of you heard of the, um, the controversy of the Nudler Gallery exactly. years ago. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, some people in the field will say, you know, I can't believe that these people bought these pieces, they didn't do the due diligence, why didn't they have more experts involved? And I think since that moment, uh, people are much more conscious of looking into provenance and getting even be it certificates of authenticity and really proven authenticity because everyone is very wary of buying exactly. fakes. So again, it goes into research and due diligence and the art consultant should be able to do that for you and also when you're working with an auction house, they should be able to do that as well. You assume that they have already done that before even come, they would even consider bringing it to the block. And the only thing I would add to that is I believe there's a five year statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. So let's say in all good faith, <coughs> we bring a picture to market and, and actually here's, I can give you a real example of a painting by an artist, Van Dongen. I went down to see a client in Key Biscayne. Beautiful painting, they bought it from Christie's in 1985, they paid $95,000. So then they're considering it for sale again. I think Van Dongen you have to show to the Wildenstein Gallery <coughs> for authenticity. It was presented to Wildenstein and Wildenstein rejected it and said it's not by the artist. So then you can't proceed with sale without the certificate of authenticity. And they have no recourse against Christie's because the statute has expired. If, again, let's, uh, let's do this all under the good faith world. If you buy a picture, then somebody says, I don't think it's right. Uh, the auction houses require you to get two outside specialists in the field to present this information to you. And most companies want to work with you in good faith to get that resolved. But the five year statute is immovable. And, and there's lots of lawsuits that have come up on that. Cheryl, yes. I'm so short of people. Is there any sort of legal, you know, if somebody asks about contract? Well, and, and it really, statute of limitations vary. I mean, in, in that case, five years. But if you say um, you have something that is authentic, but it was stolen, and, it, and you find out it's stolen, you have uh, a certain, your statute of limitations begins at that point. So from when you know or should have known something, you know, when you find out. And, and this happened, you know, a lot with, um, you know, when you have the, the Nazi looted mm -hmm. art. Um, people, it's years and years later when they find out that, you know, their parents or their grandparents or their great parents own something. And so that's when the statute of limitations starts on that. But, you know, the laws are strict and that's what keeps the courts going. You, you can't have <laughs> things go on forever. Okay, so circling back, um, so Catherine defined for us um, how to define a collection, and now there have been a couple of references about like the value of using an art consultant. Right, so why do you use the, an art consultant? Um, an art consultant uh, must listen to the client's directive and cater services based on specifics and budget. <coughs> source, so we help you to source the art to uh, connect or gain accessibility for our clients to artists, galleries, auction houses, art fairs, and so forth. Uh, we provide a broader research base um, from which to select the work. Uh, inform, uh, we keep you up to date on trends, uh, market value, activity, exhibits, um, artists to watch, just really keeping you well informed, um, certainly about the, uh, the kind of art you're, you're deciding to collect. Advice, we offer personalized objective, and I say objective advice because we're not tied to galleries or auction houses, we're independent consultants working for you. Um, we provide this advice and it's customized, customized advice for our clients based on the directive that you've given us. Ancillary services. We can help with framing, installation, appraisals for insurance or donations, inventory management, transport, and storage. Most every art consultant should be able to do this for you, provide these services, and if they cannot, they should be able to source someone or put you in touch with someone who can. Uh, educate. We try to educate you on investment value and how to structure and uh, build your collection. Again, investment value can be tricky, but we will try and navigate those waters as best we can and give you the you know, best um, advice we can uh, based on what we've learned. Uh, access, we can access closed doors, studios, collections, artworks, otherwise unavailable 
um, to the client. And this is because we have uh, built relationships over many, many years. We've developed relationships uh, with uh, many people working in the art world. And we can get into these, uh, get behind these uh, closed doors uh, because they, we have reputation, they value our experience, and we can uh, access these places that the general public so negotiate, uh, we try to negotiate better pricing for our clients. Uh, usually a gallery or artist will give you some kind of discount, hopefully. Um, art consultants can often get better discounts, again, just based on our experience and our relationships that we have uh, built over the years. Um, and again, depending on the fee structure you set up with your art consultant, the discounts we give, we can often pass on to our clients. Uh, experience. We give advice based on experience, and your art consultant should have this basic knowledge of every aspect of the art market. Due diligence. Uh, we should conduct due diligence on pricing, the quality, the condition of work, and provenance to help the client make an informed purchase. We need to learn the history of the artist, the artwork, and the body of work, and share this all with our client. We don't want them to purchase anything unless we have done this research and due diligence, and we believe in the work, we believe in the piece, and advise them to buy it. Uh, options, hiring a professional gives the client quality advice and options. You simply have more choice. Again, we offer you a much broader uh, spectrum of work from which to choose. And I put in Sherpa because recently a client called me his Sherpa, and he meant it as a compliment. <laughs> because an art consultant does all the heavy lifting for you. Uh, saving your, the client time, energy, and often uh, money. Um, so I would say, you know, when in doubt, if you were able to, you know, use an art consultant because they can really help you to navigate these waters and uh, bring you more sort of uh, make you more secure in your decisions of, of what you're buying. Um, I wanted just to go through the slides too because there's some more images. Oh, the one before it. Sorry, the one right before. Um, this is a Renee uh, Phillips. And uh, she's, a, she's a wonderful local artist. She's also showing me in the, um, in the exhibit going on right now. And the slide actually before that, uh, there we go. These are two pieces by uh, Stephen Cabral, uh, sourced through Mountain Space, thank you, Melissa. And another Renee Phillips piece uh, in that hallway there. Uh, Go forward and if we continue. Yeah. And then one more. Right, so this is um, Magnus Sodom piece in a master bedroom and a project we did and a very, very large Alex Nunez underneath the stairwell. Talking about size, we were a little worried that might not fit, and it just fit, and it was absolutely perfect. So <laughs> we got it through the doors and everything, so success. Um, right, so um, the Nina Blecky piece in a drawing room, and then this I wanted to speak about because it's a commission. It's by Jill Hotchkiss, another wonderful local artist who's shown here at the Cultural Council. Um, a client of ours saw her work uh, a work similar to this and loved it. So we brought her to the studio. She decided upon a commission and she chose the colors that she wanted and then we figured out the size that would be appropriate for this space because she knew exactly where she wanted to put it. So again, we often advise on commissions because it's a wonderful way of collaborating with an artist and also having exactly the piece you know that you want and it's customized uh, for you. So it's really a lovely way of going forward. Right, so this project, uh, the, uh, the client likes Mr. Brainwash, a, a pop artist, uh, mm -hmm. another Renee Phillips, which is similar to some of the ones she's showing in the, in the gallery here. Um, and in this hallway we have, there's a Marsango painting, I don't know if you can see it's um, the sculpture Oi by Deborah Cass, quite well known. And at the far wall there's a uh, lovely big Ben Georgia painting. Uh, this client bought a few others of Ben Georgia actually as well. And then there are two photographs, again, commissioned pieces by Tony Aruza, another lovely, wonderful local photographer. And beneath that, two glass pieces sourced through uh, local gallery Habitat uh, by Wesley Rasco. Um, so we do try and use local artists and, um, and uh, really get our clients participating in the, uh, in the arts community uh, locally and, and supporting uh, every, you know, all the artists that are working here. Cheryl. Can you give us, and we've touched on some of these things, but a brief explanation of title, copyright, and appropriation with relation to both artists and collectors? So you can see the difference between the slides, pretty and boring, <laughs> <laughs> but necessary anyway. Um, 
you know, wh why do you want to make sure you have good title? You want to make sure that, you know, it's free of liens and other kinds of encumbrances. Um, before we had the Uniform Commercial Code in this country, um, we relied on common law, and that basically was caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, you had no idea what you're getting. Now there's some protections, so you have to use them, and you have to do your due diligence. Most of the time you're gonna be working with an art advisor, um, but you know, how much due diligence you do is really gonna depend on the age of the art and the value of the art. You know, more older and more valuable, more time and energy, because otherwise, you could lose. You're better off spending the money on an art advisor and a lawyer to look at those contracts. Um, this happens to be in Florida. The Uniform Commercial Code is, is common all over the United States. There's little nuances depending on, you know, the state and, you know, the years. Or, but it's pretty uniform. That's why they call it that. The ABA developed it. And so you can look on a website. It's www.floridaucc.com. And... You, for two, two reasons, if you're, an, if you're an artist and you're selling something and people can't pay the amount you want so you're gonna finance it for them, you're gonna wanna make sure that you um, can protect your security interest in that art and you're gonna fill this out. Um, the debtor is the buyer, you're the secured party and you file this with the state. And then anyone, if that buyer decides to sell it, is gonna understand that you're still owed money on that, and there's a lien on that, just like you would have a lien on a house. Um, if you're a collector and you're buying something, you wanna know who you're buying it from if they're in debt on that, and, and you can easily look that up. So that's, that's what the Uniform Commercial Code does for you. Um, it used to be you could buy title insurance for art, but in the last couple of years, like from companies like Aris and Chubb, they stopped writing it. So it's important you know, to do your due diligence, at least start here. If there's something funny, you definitely need an art advisor to, to look at it and do a little more research into the provenance, into the history. Um, you wanna make sure that there's, it, the title's clear, that it's authentic, and you wanna make sure it's not stolen. Uh, I represented a client who was actually the son of an artist, and uh, the, the it was a sculpture. It was done in the 40s, donated in the 50s, stolen uh, from the Maritime Museum in New York City in the 70s, wow. and turned up in 2012 in, uh, I think it was, was it Harrison, New York, in Westchester mm -hmm. County. Mm -hmm. And the lady was excited because she found the artist's name etched in the bottom of it. Lo and behold, she contacted the biographer, she found it on the web, and, and he said, oh, you found the lost Lipkin. She was excited until she had to talk to the son who owned the art because you can't transfer stolen art and get good title from it. It just doesn't work, so it's important. All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about is copyright. Um, the creator owns the copyright until, that, until those rights are transferred and they can be transferred in total, or they can be transferred in part. When you own the copyright, you own the right to reproduce, to display, to make adaptations, and to perform it publicly if it's visual arts. So how do you protect it? On your visual arts, you put a C on it, and you register it with the Copyright Office. If you don't do that, you still own the copyright, but if there's an enforcement issue, um, how do you prove you own it? And that's how you prove it, by registering it and putting the C on it. Registration is important. Um, it's not expensive. You do them individually, or now they let you do 10 at once for like $85. And, but you can't put them in one PDF. It has to be 10 individual JPEG files. But it can be done online. And that's simple. It's something you can do yourself. One thing I wanted to touch on, and we talked about it when we were putting our program together is a work for hire. If you're an artist and you're working for an employer or you're working as an independent contractor, you likely don't own the copyright to that work unless you have an agreement that says you do. So that's what's important um, to make sure that if you're doing work, understanding that your employer probably owns it, if you want rights to that, make sure you're having an agreement before anything is done. And that's whether you're an employee or an independent contractor. Yes? So what if you're an artist and you're, you're asking somebody to create something for you? 
who owns the right? Is it the person who decides? The creator. So who is it? Who's the creator? If you have the concept and you ask somebody to, to design, let's say, a logo, but you imagine the concept. Okay, so the two of you are going to have an agreement that says that you own the copyright, and that's what makes it clear. Okay. It's when you talk about it, shake hands, and walk away <laughs> that it becomes very unclear. And so that's anything in the state of Florida that is valued over $500 needs to be in writing to be enforceable. Okay, so now you have done everything to protect your rights. You've registered your copyright, you've, uh, you, you own it, um, so you can create adaptations or derivative works. But what about someone else? What if they take your work and does something with it? <laughs> so we're going to get to appropriation art. And this is, this is a picture, this is a case that just drove everyone crazy. It, it happened in the... Uh, I think that the appeals court ended in 2013. It's called Carew versus Prince. And Carew, um, first let, let me just get back to, um, you know, when is it a violation? You know, it used to be it was real easy. If it's commercial and someone steals your work or uses your work, there's a violation of the copyright versus a non-for-profit use where you have an educational institution or you have satire or political commentary about work, you know, that was considered transformative enough and it wasn't a violation until this case because you had different interpretations going up through the courts. And Patrick Carriou was a photographer and he worked in the hills of Jamaica over a six year period. He gained the Rastafarians trust. Um, Rastafarians, if you don't know of them, are an insular spiritual group um, and they stay apart from mainstream society. So he does a book, it has a hundred strikingly original black and white photographs in it, but it wasn't commercially successful. He then was invited to do an exhibition of his works and sell the books at a New York City gallery. Around the same time, um, Larry Gagosian, who's an international gallerist, announced a new Richard Prince exhibition in New York. Now Richard Prince, he's a celebrated and a successful appropriation artist. He was inspired by Kiryu's book, and he imagined a make-believe post-apocalyptic <laughs> enclave um, in which bands and music are the only things to survive. So he used Carrie's images, <laughs> along with photos of his friends in the nude, to create a series of 29 paintings entitled The Canal Zone, 28 of which had Carrie images out of his 29. The lower court ruled in favor of Carrie. On appeal, though, the ruling was overturned. That was in, in 2013. And, and I, I was attending school in New York at the time, and I wrote a paper because I was so incensed. <laughs> I was just like, how can they do that? But here's what the court found. The law does not require that a work comment on the original or its author to be considered transformative. So that's the law changing right there. Mm -hmm. To qualify, the new, new work must generally must alter the original with new expression, meaning, or message. The court found that in looking at them side by side, so you have the original here, and then here's what Prince did, um, a reasonable person would conclude they have different character, a fundamentally different aesthetic. As to the commerciality, the appeals court found that the more transformative a work, the less will be the significance of the other features like commercialism. So Prince prevailed, and he and the Gogosian Gallery sold eight of the Canal Zone paintings for $10.5 million. <laughs> Seven others were exchanged for art with a value of six to eight million dollars. And I checked on Amazon, and today you can buy Yes Rasta, which was Carrie's book, for $52.47 in hardcover. And then there's a, another volume of Prince's Canal Zone paintings um, with the the court did a complete illustrated index, and that can be found for $5.65. So, you know, it's just, you just go, ah. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, did Prince give Carrie you any money? No. No, yeah. no yeah, because what, when, it, when he won on appeal, he didn't have to. Yeah. So it was, it was, to me, it was just a sad state of affairs. I just didn't like it at all. No one.
challenge that ruling? The appeal never went any further. That was the Second Circuit, New York. So the only other place you could go is to the United States Supreme Court. And it wasn't, you know, care you probably couldn't afford it. It's very expensive to go to the United States Supreme Court. I've only been there once. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about, because we've got a lot of it going on now, is computer-generated art, um, which cannot be cop copyrighted. Um, you may be able to trademark it under certain circumstances, but the courts and the copyright offices have been consistent in saying human authorship is an essential element of copyright protection. We can go to the next, next slide. slide. This one? Yes. Okay. And this is a humorous case from uh, decades ago. Um, PETA, on behalf of Naruto the monkey, uh, versus the photographer David Slater. And what happened was the monkey got a hold of Slater's camera. And he did these selfies, and they went viral. <laughs> and so Slater, in, in the process of, uh, he was in the process of settling with PETA. He was going to give him some money. But then the appeals court ruled against PETA in 2018, establishing the precedent, again, that only humans, not animals, can register for copyright and file copyright lawsuits. <laughs> those, those, those were fun slides. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so moving right along, we're, we're gonna, we've got a lot more to talk about. So um, why is it important? If you're creating an art collection, why is it important to see a lot of art? Melissa, can you take us there? Yeah. Um, well, when you're talking about collecting, um, basically collecting is, is a creative expression in itself. So the art is, you know, being made in this creative way and then essentially the best collectors are creative. So they're creating a vision with their collection. It's not just for, um, I guess, monetary value. Is that the right word? Yes. So um, when you're exposing yourself to the art that's in front of you, you're basically using your art muscles, which are your eyes, your gut, um, and you know obviously your brain because you're working with people like these smart people up here, hopefully, and they're helping you have an informed decision or you're doing the research on your own. Um, so yeah, exposing yourself to art is an extremely important muscle to flex and you can do that by exploring all the avenues in your community, which <coughs> I guess you're already doing right now by coming to this panel is you know, you're going to your museums, you're coming to events like this, galleries, um, what else do we got here? Open studios, you got Instagram, you can check out all the art holes on Instagram, um, and even websites to artists, you can reach out to them. Um, MFA shows, so you go to your local colleges and you're seeing new talent, and not just young talent, just new, and develop, people developing their practice. Um, and residency programs, there's a bunch of really amazing residency programs in South Florida, and that's an amazing space for artists as an incubator to grow as an artist and build their, to, you know, grow their, their work. And it's, I guess it's your job to kind of get out there and put yourself in front of it. Yeah. I just wanted to add one other thing. Um, with the, especially in South Florida, we have the privilege and the access to go to so many different art fairs. And art fairs is a wonderful place oh, to, yeah. to, to resource artists and different types of art. Yeah, I, I think art fairs are an amazing place to um, to purchase work. Um, me personally, I I get overstimulated fairly easily. <laughs> so I don't find that going to an art fair is the best way to learn about art, but it is 
obviously a fabulous place to buy art, especially when you're going in form. Um, I tend to go really quick. I, I go through all the booths really quick. I kind of think about what I like, maybe go to the espresso bar, and then go back to what I like and try to take my time that way. But yeah, obviously the art fairs are incredible, especially in Miami, and mm -hmm. you are getting exposed to art galleries and artists across the world. So that's the best part about art fairs. So um, in our gallery, we have a couple NFTs for sale, and there's oh. always, always questions about mm -hmm. NFTs. So I asked Melissa if she would just do a little basics of NFTs today, but I want to let you know that in May, our next art talk is all about NFTs. So this is just a little introduction, and then we're going to have a full NFT art talk in May if you're interested. Okay. Didn't somebody okay. steal that banana? <laughs> 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 yeah. Is it stolen? Is it stolen? Well, Probably that rock? is not the banana that was in our bag. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a digital NFT that was created in response to the duct tape yeah. banana in our Basel 2019. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, NFT is basically a non fungible token, um, which is, uh, wait, I have notes. I gotta, I have to like mm -hmm. go back to my notes. But essentially, um, a non-fungible token is, it, it's a, it's a copyrighted image and the way it's, or digital image. So it's a digital image that has been able to be copyrighted with a new technology called a blockchain. And you can buy an NFT with cryptocurrency, which is, does anyone not know what cryptocurrency is? We know what cryptocurrency is, right? It's driving us all crazy. <laughs> um, so essentially, it's flipping, I guess, the art world on its head in a lot of ways. It's flipping, honestly, the, the whole money market on its head. And why wouldn't art have a space in that? Um, but yeah, so it's also another thing to know about the blockchain is it creates a ledger and it's very, very difficult to um, hack the ledger. So basically every time that digital image is sold, that person that owns it and sold it is getting written in that ledger. And um, I guess that's important. Maybe someone, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well that plays into the provenance guarantee because if you've got something which is going through the blockchain process, if you literally have a ledger from the from the date when it was entered in, if it was recently produced. So there's a whole talk in the art market about integrating blockchain to pieces because that would in theory be your guarantee. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. No. So would the NFTs be viewable in your home on a screen, for example? What is the best way to, if you're going to collect them, mm -hmm. how are you going to live with them? Mm -hmm. um, I, well, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting topic. I mean, I think a lot of people are trying to explore that, um, just having a collection on, on your phone, right. um, you know, having it up on your screen in your home, I'm sure is definitely something people are exploring. Also, um, yeah, I'm kind of, I mean. I have something to add. The, um, the metaverse, I mean, if you, the metaverse is a, a completely digital world where you can buy real estate and you can furnish your real estate with very collectible NFTs. <laughs> but you could have it both in another world mm -hmm. and in your home. Yeah. If you wanted, and it would be uh, 
shown or so that you can live with it. What, what you own is the code. Yeah. Yes. You don't own the uh, that's, picture. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. own the code. So basically, but you can view the thing. You could have a screen in every house. house. Yeah. Yeah. You could have your coin collection so, displayed in every house you have. So it's really about, it's really about ownership. Yes. Bottom line, it's not about the work as much as it is about a, a, a stream of ownership. Yes. Exactly. Like the image can be printed out by anyone, anyone of us. us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have uh, two objections to cryptocurrency and NFTs. Let's hear it. <laughs> First of all, they're secretive and therefore they encourage uh, malfeasance. And secondly, they use way too much electricity mm -hmm. and are not sustainable. And for that reason, I, 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 I'm an artist, I'm a collector, I'm also a real estate broker, but I will not accept cryptocurrency yeah. for one of my listings because I just don't believe in it. I, I think we're all of, a, of the age where you want something tangible. I think in the younger markets, they, they seem to really thrive on this and they grew up on playing those games, you know, and, and thinking they were getting value when they were buying farm animals that really weren't fair. So it's kind of like well, you have to think wearing of, clothes. You have to think of the environmental consequences yeah. over time, though. And Absolutely. With cryptocurrency, it's, it's not a good picture. what you're aiming for. If you're aiming for some kind of um, increase in value in the atmosphere, or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> or do you want to wake up in the morning and have your collection and walk out into your living room and grin because it's a cheery, I mean, I'm a collector, and I love my collection. Yeah. It makes me happy every morning yeah. when I wake up. I mean, it's, a it's a different perspective. I couldn't agree more. Is it copyright of the code? Or yeah, the it's, it's of the code. It's the code. That's so right. I have a question with that. So is this a reflection to some extent of the art market kind of becoming the issue around art and its marketability or its um, value? Is it somewhat related to that, or does it have no relationship to that, and it's just part of like what happens when things become digital? I'm dull enough to think it's a fad, but I know it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an 18th century European furniture specialist. <laughs> 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 I get, I get it. I get, I get the idea. I love the idea. If you own a phenomenal painting that you could then have it converted, have it, have an NFT made of that object, so then when you so you're lucky enough to, to summer in, in the Northeast and come down in the winter, and you can have that image in, displayed in both places. But why somebody wants to pay, however the hell they want to pay for it, a terrible pixelated yeah. image of a banana and duct tape, <laughs> that's not art. No. Well, that's not, that's just, that's transactional. Worth, here, that's why I'm asking this yeah. question. But so the value of what's to. happened to art, okay, is you mentioned yeah. earlier that there, it's a lot of subjective decision making mm -hmm. and 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 value mm -hmm. right so I'm wondering to what extent the NFT is a phenomenon of the digital world becoming dominant or the fact that um, art has become so monetized it's the first it's yeah, I mean, well, I think one you'll have to come to the talk next month. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 Two, I, I, I don't, it's, it's I, from what I know, and I may be wrong, it's there's, there's a lot of talk of it, but it's a very, very, very small slice. Yeah. Of it's just another medium. Yeah. It's yeah. just another medium. And mm -hmm. then the other thing, I listened to a very interesting podcast about the art market, to, to always trying to learn, is that the cryptocurrencies that you have to purchase these works in, you have very limited options in what you can spend this cryptocurrency on. So the pricing doesn't really reflect the real world. Because if you're sitting on $10 million worth of a cryptocurrency that you can only spend on four collecting categories, well, it doesn't matter what you spend on it, because you can only spend it there. You can't translate it into another real world use. But that's for the next talk. 
So just to wrap up, I'll let people ask questions, but before we do, can I just ask the panelists um, any things that you would suggest to read and learn about art and collecting, blogs, websites, books, like your favorite thing, resource, and also, I, a lot of you have talked about the benefits of what you do uh, in your particular field. But if there's something that you haven't touched on that you feel that brings value to a client that you um, specifically work with, if you could point that out as well. Melissa, you want to start with that one? Um, can you just recap again? So the things that, anything that you, any resources for reading and learning about art and collecting that you think are great? I'm, I don't really have anything off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. And benefits, I was thinking as, a, as we didn't really talk about as a gallerist, we talked a lot about what an advisor does for a collector, but getting to know your gallerists, getting to know your local gallerists and who they're looking at and who they're bringing in, what their, mm -hmm. what their program, their season's looking like, that's a really valuable resource. And that's, to me, that's why it's really important to have a local gallery as opposed to a lot of these galleries that are just coming from New York for a season briefly popping up. Mm -hmm. I think you can talk to a gallerist so that's in your community all year round. That's fantastic. So Thank uh, you. that's a plug to you. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I mean, just like I was saying, collecting is an art, so is programming and creating mm -hmm. programming. And me and Kenny have been working really hard to kind of put together a vision. I think that, I think, resonates in our values and we really stand behind the work and I, I yeah I, I'm not sure where I'm going with that but <laughs> thank you you said that nicely. Mm -hmm. Catherine, do you have any um, right so I remember the days of reading art magazines and to be honest I just found them sort of yard of long and dense and wordy and often very pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so I tend to get my art news now if I'm reading uh, on my phone, I and sort of quick articles uh, written by um, writers that I know, critics that I respect, uh, even artsy editorial I look at sometimes. There's you know uh, the digital version of art news, wide walls, all sorts of things that I do tend to get on my phone. Um, and I want to go back to art fairs because I was going to bring this up because actually for uh, an art consultant they're very important to us. Uh, for various reasons, we can bring our clients there. It is the best opportunity to see so many galleries and so much art under one roof. And then also for networking, to, to gather information, to meet other artists and gallerists and collectors and find out, what are you collecting? What's this trend? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, I too go through an art fair quite quickly if I'm not with a, with a client. Um, and I can tell like, oh, look, Pop's really back in again now. Or, oh yeah, now this fair, they're showing a lot of works on paper. Or, you know, what's this trend? Or like, oh, everyone's really into Jonas Wood. I've seen him in like five booths. Mm -hmm. So you do learn a lot from fairs. And I think that's very important. And um, again, as an art consultant, gathering information for our clients, it's important that we go and we look and we absorb. And it's a wonderful opportunity to take, you know, to take all of that in. Um, do you want me to touch on why uh, you say why we should use why to use our services? Or? Well, I think you you talked about art advising. And yeah. Just say also it's just the personal experience of being with an art consultant instead of Google instead of using Google. Yeah. It's um, you know it's it's wonderful to share this experience with someone else and you know have a sounding board for your opinion um, and also. You know, I, I love what I do, and I hope I can share that passion with my clients, and I convey that to him and to them, and make the process, uh, you know, really fun and exciting. And it's, it's more fun to do it with someone than to, you know, do it with a computer. <laughs> Cheryl, um, yes, for my everyday work, when I do legal work, I'll use a treatise. It's heavy. I didn't bring it. It's called the Art Law by Lerner and Bressler out of New York, and I, I. It's like my Bible, I have two sets, but it's very expensive, it's like $400 and probably only lawyers would wanna read it. I think this is a nice book for collectors. It's called The Art of Collecting, mm -hmm. and you have different various um, collectors, some of them famous, some of them not so, talking about what they like about it, how they go about it, and so I think that this is a, it's a nice book. Cool. Um, the other thing that I use a lot is Artnet. I, um, that has a good price database, uh, it's a good place to start for values, also, they have good uh, news reporting. I get you know daily little notes about trends and different things happening. Sometimes I'll share those on my social media. Um, so, mm. that's what I use. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I would say I'm a big fan of art fairs and auctions as well because they're both opportunities to walk through these uh, venues and see property and get up close and personal. Museums are fabulous, but they sometimes feel very, I just was at the Getty in LA, and it's amazing, but you're not allowed to get within six feet of something. Whereas, a, whereas, a, whereas an auction house or a gallery or a, a art fair, you can really have an intimate experience with the pieces. In terms of what I use for my price research, there's a website called liveauctioneers.com. And it's an aggregator where all auction, many auction houses, hundreds if not thousands, put their sales. So if you're a collector and you're looking for, again, I use the word Rolex, you put the keyword search into live auctioneers and every auction house globally that runs their sales on them puts it through there. And so I use it as a great resource for price research. Mm -hmm. And it's a really great place because you can see what people are paying real time for objects. Uh, Invaluable is another one, but that's subscription based. And then Artnet I love as well, obviously, because that's really, that indexes the artists and does a really great job of that. Do your, your um, Doyle has a, a place where you show your auction, upcoming auctions somewhere, right? There's a so we have a retail, we have a storefront on Palm Beach Island, on Brazilian and South County. And at the moment, thank you, we're having a, just Monday through Friday, we're uh, showing highlights of the collection of Jay Kislak. He was a philanthropist from Miami. And he was, um, he gave, in 2015, he gave 6,000 pieces to the Library of Congress. Wow. He was a voracious collector. Wow. Huh. And we have an exhibit of 19th century Florida and Bahamian maps, which cool. is very, very cool. Oh, nice. And some Roman glass artifacts, as well as uh, books on early Florida history as mm -hmm. well. So yeah. I encourage you to stop by. So that changes with your auctions? That changes. So we, we have the storefront down here. Um, uh, Doyle, the auction house, we've been in business for 60 years uh, on the Upper East Side and in the same location for 45 of those years. Mm -hmm. And then we are just the, the regional office down here. Yeah. And Jessica, you asked us to bring some cards, so I'll leave oh, yes. them on the table yeah, if anyone is interested. And questions, people, before we wrap up? Yeah. Yes. I was just wondering with um, art advising, if you could give us some idea of kind of a generic fee base, how that works. I realize um, that that's a, it's it's a very good question, and it's, it's, it's very loose. It really depends on the project and the scope of the project. So some art consultants will work just on an hourly fee, and others will work commission-based. Com, commission so you have to discuss that you know, with them, and oftentimes you know, it'll, it'll be a combination of both. It's really the, the scope of the project and you know, what, what, what you envision, but it's either going to be partially hourly or commission-based. It's also, I mean, relating to just what you're, you're talking about, it's what your aim is as, as a collector. Are you truly a collector of a certain kind of art? Mm -hmm. Or are you decorating a house? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This was yeah. something I was going to bring up before because there's art consultants and they're interior decorators. Right. And they're very different. And you hire an art consultant because they have the experience, the knowledge, the education. Whereas you know an, an interior designer uh, might, but for the most part, you know we we work in two different wheelhouses. Mm -hmm. And so if you really want you know original uh, art, unique original art, you would see an art consultant. If it's just decorative, perhaps the interior designer can help you with that. Did you have another question, Jessica? I did. I just wanted to know if you're a novice collector, how would I even go about determining who is a good source for an art consultant? How would I get started by finding a good one? Again, ask in your community. You know, you're here. Ask Jessica. You know, ask the people you know. Ask the gallerists that uh, you like, artists that you like. Do you know of art consultants, local art consultants? It's really word of mouth, and I find that I've gotten most of my clients through word of mouth because I work with so many artists and gallerists, and you know, auction houses know me. So it's just ask. I would say, you know, ask people that you trust in the art world. Hey, do you know that you know a good art consultant? Um, perhaps even one that specializes in this. You know. What if you want someone to help you with you know, a collection of certain kinds of miniatures? And you're like, oh, I know someone that does that. So again, it's, it's asking around and start with you know, these, these um, you know, community institutions and resources because um, I, Jessica very kindly has um, you know, referred both clients and artists to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you mind to go back to the second slide? I just want to grab a picture of it. The it's the one right after, the, I think, the first slide where the definition was a primary and secondary. Okay. Secondary, that. So next, the one next after. That's my one. You don't want to. <laughs> 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 Pretty straightforward. Anyone else have questions? Thank you so much.
Thank you.